Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like Diamonds, back again. We're talking about shrimp lures versus paddle tail lures. We got Luke, Richard, Justin. Luke, I like the haircut, dude. Would you go in and say, "Give me your best pixie cut"? Is that what you? Is that what you guys? I know are it's now? got a little bit more aerodynamic. You know, it's uh, it was getting. I knew it was getting too long when I'm out fishing with the hat on and the hair is still blowing around in my face. So, got to do what you got to do. Uh well, but it was interesting. You. As they got longer, my fish catching got better and better. So I'm like actually a little bit nervous to go out uh, next time with the shorter hair. It's probably Ooh. it's probably like having bananas, right? Like might as well. Might as well just our time to shine. Luke yeah, said I and mean, there's great YouTube videos on how to uh, you know French braid your hair. So I just let it keep going. And no, no braiding, no man buns. It's uh, just a hat. Nice bun. It's a mon bun. <laughs> All right. I digress. So, you know, we, we did a webinar here recently and it was talking about three lures and, and you probably can guess some of the ones that, that, that we mentioned in this webinar that, that just out fish like pretty consistently live bait. And a lot of it's because of time, right. You know, given the same amount of time, uh, if you only had two hours of fish, I'd rather go out and fish with lures versus spending an hour trying to get live bait and all the stuff that goes along with that from, you know, making sure you've got chum and you can find the bait and you got a good working live well, et cetera. And so we got some questions from that. Like, well, Hey, like you guys didn't really talk about, you know, shrimp and, and what's crazy is power prawn is now outselling slam shady. So power prawn is our fastest selling lure over at fishstrong.com. And that sucker catches some big fish. But it's not something you're going to use all the time, right? And, and I think it can be a little bit tougher, too. It's, it's a little bit more advanced, right? You know, you're not going to tell someone their very first time going out there trying to catch a, a trout. And we're going to talk about species specific. We're going to talk about depth. We're going to talk about structure specific. Like, you know, when you would, what types of structure you would want to use a shrimp over a paddle tail and vice versa. But it's not something you want to give a brand new person because uh, it's a little bit more advanced. But then again, it's not that hard to use. And man, that sucker just keeps catching big fish. So we want to jump on a podcast and talk about that. Talk about, all right, so you will instantaneously know when I should be going for an artificial shrimp like Power Prawn, like Power Prawn and also when you should be going to a Slam Shady, let's just say, in, in a three, three and a half, four, or even five inch. So who wants to kick it off? What do you, uh, we got structure, we got even speed, you know, if you're power fishing versus uh, you know, you know, in, in a targeted area, we got depth. What do you guys think? What's what well, comes first? I'll start off too, just because in that in that discussion where we had three lures, um, we didn't say a, a shrimp lure per se, but this that we did mention the leprechaun, which is um, I'm showing it for those listening. It's a split tail jerk bait, and when doing the double twitch retrieve method that we recommend, it it really mimics. It, although it doesn't look like a shrimp, the action of the water, like the action it has in the water very closely resembles a scared shrimp that darts up off the bottom and then slowly flutters down. This is a split tail jerk shad with a, a little uh, on, a, on a weighted hook. And so this is all, you know, this basically mimics both a scared shrimp and even injured bait fish. That's why it's, that's why we included it in the, in the main three. And it's much easier to rig all that. Um, and then what Joe mentioned on the power prawn, which is this big guy here, um, this does catch bigger. My average fish size has increased since using these, but as Joe mentioned, it's, it's more advanced, um, particularly this, this particular one where this is made in Brazil. The material is very tough. It's very, it's a last longer, but it's much, much harder to rig. So this is not something I would ever recommend for somebody brand new. Who's not like very accustomed to rigging, rigging baits. We're going to make both rigging and everything else easier in the near, in the near future, seeing how effective this has been. But for now, this is like for more of the, like the, I would say intermediate to advanced fishermen. Just wanted to make sure that was clear up front. Yep. Good. Justin? Uh, there's so much to talk about with this. Um, you know, offline, we were, it's kind of like this big web uh, that we're trying to narrow down when you're going to throw what. If we can try to make it into a science, right, of when you want to throw a paddle tail versus a shrimp lure. For me, if we were to take it into different categories, I would say water clarity and substrate or structure, whether it's sand or it's mud or oysters or grass is going to determine whether I throw one or the other. Um, I generally, if I had to pick between one of the two for different situations, 
if I'm fishing in really clear water and most of the time, four out of five of the times that I go into fishing, I like sight fishing. I like watching the behavior of the fish that I'm trying to catch. So whether that's trout, snook, or redfish, I can see their every move. I can watch their behavior. I can determine whether I want to play a cat and mouse game with that fish, or whether they're on the move and they're ready to chase down bait against a shoreline. And that kind of determines whether I'm going to have a slower presentation or I'm going to have a bait fish presentation. It's going to be a little more erratic. It's going to give off a little more vibration. But to be really, really specific, something that I've had a lot of great success with this year on the power prawn is uh, two different situations. So I have one on a jig head and one rigged weedless. And a lot of times, just for a quick hookup, I'll throw the weedless option, if that'll focus, might not, or uh, I'm sorry, the jig head option. And I'll throw this over sand when it's crystal clear. And the challenge that I've had is I'll find a big snook or I'll find a big trout, a redfish. And if they are sitting still and they're over like maybe a little trough or like a little kind of like a dust bowl, I don't even really know what to call it. There's no structure around that they're orienting themselves to. And they're just kind of sitting there. It can be really, really tough to get these fish to bite because if you work a paddle tail by them or a jerk bait or something erratic, they get spooked by too much action. So in those situations, and especially with the prawn kind of being a neutral color, it blends in with the sand really well. If you can just get this on the bottom and slowly glide it past them with like a faint pop, then you're getting this instinctual response for them to pounce on it. So they don't really feel intimidated because a shrimp is nothing to be afraid of as long as it's not super aggressive and bouncing all over the place. You don't need to draw a lot of a, uh, you know attention to yourself in clear water, but I can get these impulse bites with a power prawn that I can't get with any other lure. I mean, I'm sure I could you know, take a, take a slam shoe 2.0 and drag it. But because of that tail thumping around, I guess I feel that it might be too much vibration in a clear water setting. So that's kind of unique where I feel like this is my go-to. Um, and then for the weedless option here is when I'm over grass. So if I'm sight fishing, redfish and trout, and they're laid up around a pothole or their nose down in the grass, this is my go-to because I can work it very slowly. Because a lot of these bait fish are not trying to, whether it's a shrimp or an actual bait fish, are not trying to scoot out of the grass and just take off full speed. They, they want to hide themselves from, from the predator. So I can slow down my presentation and just like with a scalpel, just like dissect the area, the dinner plate that these fish are going to feed in. Um, those are the two situations that I'll use, whether the junior or the original size. I tend to throw the original size if I'm going for bigger redfish and I just want a bigger meal, you know, a better opportunity for the fish, but um, sand and grass, but both are clear water scenarios for me. Now there's other times, Luke, that I know you throw prawns a lot around docks. Like that's, that's probably, you always have that tied on when you're fishing docks. I haven't had a lot of chance to do that this year, but that's another time that I would think to throw the prawn, right? Yeah. Docks and reefs, like deep water structure. And, and again, just as Justin said, usually a little bit clear water. But, uh, but even in murky water, so put on a bigger jig head. This is what I learned from one of our members, Marcos, who really introduced us to these shrimp in the first place. He uses a minimum of half ounce jig heads, in many cases ounces. And although this doesn't have much vibration, like a paddle tail is great for like churned up water, like darker water, like where Richard fishes, um, because it gives off that vibration. And this, this really shrimp mold itself is very streamlined. But if you're thumping on the bottom, that attracts the fish. And so that's what I'm sure Richard's going to talk about. But, but for deeper water where there's a lot less light down there on the bottom, um, you thump it, you basically thump it on the bottom, even on reefs. Like we were, we were fishing these things and up to 80 feet of water, catching all sorts of species. It is shockingly effective. It's something I never would have thought of throwing a shrimp lure offshore, like it were near shore reefs. Uh, but it's really about just getting that thump and then just that quick action. It even, you know, it's just an instinct bite. Right. It's just like fish are programmed to take advantage of a of an easy prey and shrimp are, you know, kind of helpless down there once they spook off. And as it's slowing down, those fish just come up and hammer it and, uh, and good fish, too. So to kind of summarize that point, a time that you would almost always go power prawn or, or some type of shrimp lure over, let's just say a paddle tail like slam shady would be clearly offshore. If you're fishing in 50 feet of water and just vertical popping it, you're not going to put a half ounce jig head on slam shady i mean you could you could yeah, you could but the for the offshore it's it's usually more clear so it's really not a water clarity thing but 
these paddle tails, right? This big tail, it gives off vibration. It also gives water drag. And so to sink a big paddle tail in 50 feet of water is gonna take a ton of time or a ton of weight. You'll need like two ounces of weight and to get the same drop rate as like a half ounce on the power prong, just cause it's so streamlined. So for the offshore stuff, it's really about getting to the bottom. That's where the strike zone is. And so there it's just get to the, get to the bottom. Um, whereas inshore, like if it's calm and clear, I'm using, I'm not using paddle tails inshore because as Justin mentioned, it's just too much vibration. It's not natural. It's like hearing a, like a camp at a night and like a little squirrel is, is walking on, on leaves. It sounds like it's a bear, right? Like it's same with fish. If it's super calm out, nothing naturally is making a bunch of ruckus. And except it's something big that doesn't care about getting found. Is that so why you wet your paddle. pants? We went camping last time when you beat the tent. <laughs> You promise you wouldn't say that. <laughs> Squirrel. <Come on>. <laughs> <laughs> the hair and now that you're out me on everything. Um, but yeah, so it's just smart to think about the 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 actual vibe. Like, is it unnaturally? Right. The the key is to present a good lure in front of a fish without spooking it. And as long as it's a good lure, they'll come up and and they're not spooked. They'll they'll come up and swipe it. Fish are less picky than a lot of people think. So it's really just getting like a good looking lure that has the right action, and they'll come up and smack it. Cool. What you got, Richard? Yeah, you're so right on that, especially, you know, there's just so much to talk about with this topic. So I'm just going to kind of go through a little bit of my thought process. And, you know, I'm up here, you know, in Northeast Florida, you know, in Georgia and all as well. So there's a lot of just murky water. So whenever I'm fishing a new area, I'm almost always going to have, you know, a paddle tail thrown on and a shrimp, but I kind of use them differently, you know, and I really use that paddle tail, you know, first to kind of locate those fish because all I'm looking for is that one maybe two aggressive fish to start with and then I can really start to hone and dial in kind of what the trends are going to be for that area in that day you know and that paddle tail you know especially in some murky water you know it's going to put off some vibration and all you need sometimes is one aggressive fish and then once you can kind of figure that out that's when I really like to start going into you know not necessarily I'm always sight fishing you know where I am unless it's real real low tide but um you know what I like to do is then switch over to a shrimp profile because almost everything is going to eat a shrimp if presented right um and going into what you were saying too Luke with the weight that is huge especially if you start talking about different species so, you know, one of the things I really like to do, if I'm going to be targeting redfish a little bit more, I'm probably going to look into doing a little bit more of a heavier jig or something like that. And you don't need a really fast presentation, you know, for reds, especially like a low tide. So I'll put more of like a jig head on, especially like the power prawn. But, you know, if it's for trout, one of my favorite things I've been doing recently is actually just putting on a regular just weighted hook, you know, like an eight, one eighth ounce and letting it go with the current. Um, not hit the bottom, you know, and almost a little bit of a dead stick type uh, situation. And the trout cannot stand that because it looks exactly like a shrimp is just getting washed away with the current. And man, they they tear it up. Um, and then kind of going into the uh, the jerk bait here that you're talking about. This is one of my favorite lures for using around high tide and like a lot of grass and stuff like that, because what you can do, this is just so narrow and streamlined you can throw this weedless presentation into the grass and just really reel it slowly and kind of slide it through the grass. And that's exactly where the, especially redfish, you know, where they're at right there in that first five feet or so of grass. And this just comes slowly sliding by no bumping or anything, and they will pick it up. They'll find it. And it's been awesome for high tide around here. You got me, uh, you got me excited on that drift in the shrimp idea. Cause in the winter time, Mm -hmm. I'll take I'll take live shrimp and I'll drift bridges at night for bulls yeah. over in Titusville. And now you got me thinking like I got to really bump back that weight and just like just drift midwater super super slow. Um, yeah. I love that. Like not 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 hopping it around. Different technique than bouncing bottom, right? You're letting it go with the current and kind of just like like the conveyor belt. That's really cool. That makes a yeah. lot of sense. Yeah, it's almost that, you know, technique that is used in fly fishing in a river, right? You know, you want that dead drift. It just looks natural. It's a little bit more advanced because you do have to have a little bit of slack in your line. So a lot of times, that's why I like the high-vis yellow line. I can actually see the line move a little bit, and um, it, it works great. Docks as well, especially at night, um, because you don't want a real heavy presentation at night. You can throw it 
ahead of the lights or ahead of where that target zone is, by the time that, you know, weight and lure gets there, it's probably right in the strike zone within two to three feet. So it, it's really effective. And That's you're, cool. you're definitely more manly when you can go back and tell your friends you caught it on a shrimp or a power prawn versus a nymph. Yep. Oh, how'd you catch that one? Caught it on a little nymph. Yeah. <laughs> the four <four-aught> hook, man. <laughs> Yeah. what's that one video and uh what's that that funny guy is the fly fishing guy's name uh where he gets the the three random people to take his course and he's like are you guys fly curious and he's like yeah i'm yeah. fly curious <laughs> yeah. it's hilarious uh, that's a good one uh so let me get this straight you catch it and then you release it <laughs> you put it back in the water <laughs> A classic yeah and so um also just so that just for clarity too as far as the choosing of one versus the other watercolor water clarity is a big thing you know the, the visibility spectrum but also i almost think that what trumps that is is just looking to see what sometimes fish are keyed in only on bait fish or only on shrimp and so that's just one thing to keep in mind like lately the the big bomber has been my ticket it's been awesome the big paddle tail um and then all of a sudden this the bunch of small little bait fish comes in and is starting to get washed in and that's all they cared about i was throwing the bomber through like literally snooker feeding like jacks and i would reel that bomber through there they didn't care right it, although it was bait fish it was too big right and they were only keyed in on that one thing and so when they get when they when there's a lot of one thing in an area you have to match it as close as you can so if it's a bunch of bait fish a paddle tail is going to be the ticket or like the little nub lure that this is what ended up working best that day because they were only keyed in on small bait fish. So I gave it um, a little, a little double twitch, you know, retrieve that mimic the small bait fish. If you're seeing um, a bunch of shrimp skipping on the water and fish feeding on shrimp, even if the water's super murky, you want to throw a shrimp lure, right? Because they're keyed in on shrimp. But in most cases, those, those are like the two anomalies that it's like very rare when they're only keyed in on one thing. So in most cases, the majority of cases is what we talked about where if it's murky um, or if, if it's really not calm and clear, then paddle tails pretty much win. Because in most cases, if, if like I've you know, cleaned a lot of fish over the years, in most cases, I'll actually open up the stomach just to see what, what's in there. And it's very rare when it's just one thing, right? There's like, sometimes there's crabs and bait fish, sometimes shrimp and bait fish. And every once in a while you'll get one and there's like 10, 10 bait fish in there where they're like totally keyed in on bait fish. Um, so, so just make, make the definitely factor in the prey that you're seeing in the area. Like that kind of trumps everything else. But if you're not seeing anything in particular, then default to, okay, is it calm and clear? Yes. Okay. Let's make sure to use a finesse bait, like a power prawn, or again, for, for more of a newbie, I would say the leprechaun. Um, but then if it's, if it's murky or if it's really windy, then the default is a paddle tail. And then it's just a matter about selecting the right size. So, so I think that would be like the best, like the cheat sheet, if you will, for those selections. And let's just say three feet or less of water. If you're using the power prawn, how are you rigging it? Hmm. I, I mean, it depends on if there's structure. Yeah. yeah if, the, if there's structure on the bottom, then with like what Justin showed, the weedless rig. Just because you want to be near the structure and you obviously don't want to get snagged right there. So what would jig hit or a uh, hook is that? That's uh, that's the custom one that we've had before, but I've done. So on the, on the original size, I like just a four odd eighth ounce owner, you know, one or twist lock. That's been a good substitute. Um, I like the custom one just because they got the weight up front. So it, it tends to die down nose, nose first, but yeah, over grass, calm water, clear conditions. Like that's always tied on. Um, what about, you know, I had a situation over this past weekend, I went to Ozello and the water was crystal clear and there's grass, but the wind was honking. It was like 20 to like 15, to 20 mile an hour winds around certain areas. I could not get away with throwing the prawn because I could not sit still. And I definitely couldn't see the bottom or see, you know, the orientation of, of how to present. And in that situation, like power fishing was really the way to go to cover a lot of water. Um, so even if it is clear and even if it is, does have grass on it, that wind and the current whipping around all these points, could I drift the power prawn? Yes, I could. But in terms of covering more water, more efficiently, 
I, the Slam Shady 2.0 on a jig head, I was bouncing that around and I got to like 22 inch redfish pretty quick bouncing on bottom. And it just because I could get down to bottom a little bit faster with this method. Um, if I wanted to pick it up and just paddle tail it right along the bottom and just get a little more vibration moving quickly, it looks like bait fish whipping around with the current um, that this ended up out producing in that situation. So, I mean, yeah, you could really like tailor it down to all the specific scenarios, but in general, a good baseline for finesse, as Luke said, like Alabama leprechaun or prawn and calm clear and then paddle tail and anything with slightly murky or windier conditions where you need to cover more water and you can't really dissect an area as well. And then I'm, I'm going to throw in size of fish. You know, we've been doing this for a while. We've got 25, now almost 26,000 members. We've got thousands of people posting members, you know, insiders every single week inside of our community. And I see so many reports. There's definitely a trend where someone says, man, I had one of my best days ever for just fish catching. And they're usually using a paddle tail, right? They're covering a ton of ground. They're power fishing. They caught 11 species. Like, man, we had tight lines forever, but I'm seeing the PB, right? You know, you see the, someone's title, it says, I got my PB flounder I saw over the weekend, got my PB best trout, PB snook, and it was all in the power problem, which is really interesting. Not to say that there haven't been tons of personal best with the slam shady panel tail, but the, I've seen a ton of people saying, I just caught my biggest XYZ on the power problem. What's that? Red, that's a redfish you caught? Look at that camo, dude. That's all I'm, I'm noticing your outfit. It looks sharp. <laughs> Where's biggest, biggest redfish on artificial was probably 42, 43 yeah. on the prawn. Like that was, that, was, yeah. that was when you first started using it too, wasn't it? Was that yeah, mean? that was in the beginning. I was like, I gotta go try this thing out. And I came back, I'm like, hey guys, this works. <laughs> and you had a monster trout recently, right? On the power prawn. Yeah, yeah. Again, over that scenario of just uh fishing crystal clear sand, and it was, you know, it's tough to to present to these fish. I mean, I've had it earlier this year too, where for those of you that know, if you find big trout and they're sitting over sand and they're laid up, they're some of the pickiest fish to get to eat. Like you're going to spook more than you hook, but a combination of the power prawn, because it was more of a finesse approach with a little bit of Dr. Juice, which I think that's unfair. That's, that's unfair. I know. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that will, that'll like, you'll get anything to bite any hundred pound tarpon on the flats. I'll hit, they'll hit doc, uh, Dr. Juice on a lure, but, uh, but I did get like a 25 inch trout here we go on the power prone again which was solid that was a that was a monster um just laid up it was probably 15 20 feet from the ginu just sitting there popped it once it scooted away i'm like oh no i spooked it and then he made a 180 degree turn and then looked at it i'm like nobody move don't breathe and one quick lift and he hammered it so i was like okay it was about finesse i mean if you can see these fish and you can see their behavior if if i had a paddle tail and there's that thump of the tail Maybe if it looked like it was, you know, dying on the sand, you might pick it up. But I feel like that shrimp really sealed the deal. So it's, it's a very technique specific lure, but it can award you some of your biggest catches. It's, it's always one of my go-to sight fishing lures. Yep. And in, in Rex, remember that was the first time we used it, Luke, with Marcos down near, you know, Chukalusky way down. And we start going offshore. We're like, what are we doing? And he's like, drop it right here. And we're literally just like vertical dropping it on a half ounce or ounce. I don't even remember what it was. It was a big old jig head. And we're just popping it off the bottom. And I mean, you know, when a 40 inch snook hits, it is like game on. And you're just getting these thumps. And then we were bringing up 40 inch snook on this power prong. We were like blown away. And then we went and caught redfish. We caught trout and we like monster fish. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, it's, it's still unexplainable. But I think a lot of people are skeptical and then they buy it and they're like, holy smokes, this thing absolutely works, but it doesn't work in all situations, which is the whole reason we're doing this, this podcast. Um, what else, Richard? I thought you're going to, you look like you're going to say something. Yeah. So not to get too much in the weeds with situations, but going a little bit on the opposite spectrum of what Justin was seeing where, you know, you're sight fishing for a single fish you know, especially kind of where I'm at really all through the summer and spring. I mean, we have got so much bait everywhere you can walk on it. So sometimes it's pretty difficult to get your lure noticed. And one thing you can do this on both of these lures, but throw a popping cork in front of these guys, you know, and what's I've done before, especially if you've got two anglers, have one person with a paddle tail or bait fish imitation, have somebody else with the shrimp. 
and even do it at different depths. And man, you can really figure out quickly kind of what those fish are keyed in on because sometimes they're chasing it and you see a shrimp, you see mullet, you see, I mean, menhay and all of it, you know, it's going to be everywhere. So that's a really good way to kind of get that instinctual bite to key in, you know, on the lure that you're already throwing, but it might not get noticed unless you have that kind of pop or other feeding, you know, sound next to it. So that's been something that I've done a lot through the spring and summer that's been really effective. That's yeah. And awesome. I, would, I would say, the, um, and just one thing to keep in mind, regardless of whether it's the paddle tail or the power prawn or like a split tail, like an album leprechaun is depth control. Depth control is, is crucial. That's why we, we do all of our lures without pre-rig, without pre-rigging them because when you pre-rig, now you only have one depth, one depth range. And it's usually a pretty small depth range that this one lure is only good for this one depth range. And what I found best for, again, for all three of those situations, regardless of which lure type is to have some jig heads, right? Some have, have jig heads of different sizes. This is the open water. This is the max um, strike to hookup ratio is a jig head with an open, right? The hook is exposed. And then for weedless nature, which is incredibly important, is to have some weighted hooks. That way you can you have a lure um, where the, the hook point is, is not exposed. Either it's laying up close to the lure or it's, in this case, you actually embed the very tip of it. Um, this, is, this is really where most of this, the, the strikes happen because when they're going after redfish, sea trout, snook, flounder, they're all ambush predators. They're all, in most cases, they're going to be holding next to structure. That's where they're most comfortable. That's where they do the most feeding. That's where they're the less spooky, the, I should say the least spooky. And uh, so weedless is what, is what I do most of the time because I'm usually fishing tight to mangroves or fishing seagrass and, uh, or docks. Uh, but then what Justin mentioned too, if you're on an open flat that has some like potholes, that's when the fish are really, really spooky. And in that case, you don't have to worry so much about getting stuck on structure. So you might as well use a open a jig head like what Justin's holding. That way, when you do get that strike, you're gonna maximize your odds of landing it. So, so always think about depth control and then the, the weedlessness or, or not weedlessness. And we actually have, for how important it is, in case you haven't seen it, we do have a, uh, a, a cheat sheet for all of the lures, like all of our lures. And then for each size of each lure, what jig heads and which weighted hooks are best for each depth range. And so that's super helpful. So if you haven't yet checked it out, we'll put a link down below or you can just go to like saltstorm.com and use the little search bar at the top and just look for a lure guide cheat sheet. If you do that search, you'll see it, but that is incredibly important. Yeah. So I always wanna make sure to, to never, for many years, this is all I threw, right? This is like when I was doing tournaments, this is all I threw, I just still did good, but I could only fish in really shallow water with seagrass because that's what I was throwing. Uh, my results would have been a lot better had I been a little bit more open to fishing the inlets, right? In the summer um, where those bigger fish are, are usually gravitating to there, I just didn't have a lure for it. I didn't have the depth control for it. So um, don't do that and that's the same mistake I did. It, no telling how many more fish I would have been catching those tournaments. Don't buy the pre-rigged shrimp. Yeah. I mean, DOA shrimp, they've worked forever. But their target market was kind of newbies, right? Hey, just give them a pre-rig on. It fished it in this depth. But I think so many people make the mistake of now trying to use that same little small shrimp with a small weight on a 10-foot dock with current, and they're not catching anything. And it's it's not even close to hitting the bottom, right? I mean, it, it, and, and it's interesting. The more we've had some pretty big, uh, big-name pros on here and guides, and they're all like, yeah, why would I ever buy a pre-rigged anything? Uh, you know, and same with the professional bass guys, right? I mean, they're sitting there doing all kinds of altercations to their, their rigs, uh, to get it just perfect for the right depth and uh, the right type of structure. So it's very, very important and definitely download that cheat sheet. If you haven't already, it's super, super helpful. And we'll continue to add to it as well and, and make changes as we bring on new lures, et cetera. But one thing you probably won't see us bringing on is, is pre-rigged shrimp. Uh, we, yeah, I mean, they're, we they're have... good for newbies. Like they, yeah. they are like for newbies, they're great. But, uh, but, you know, for, you know, we have a fishing club and even when newbies come on board, they're not newbies for very long at all, because it really goes through, you know, all the details, the entire foundation. Um, so, and so that obviously includes rigging because it's so important. Oh, yeah. So there's still, there's definitely a need for it, but for once you get intermediate advanced, you really, you'll find yourself using a lot less of them. Yep. One other kind of cool tip in terms of a type of structure 
and, and Justin, you kind of mentioned it with the sand is, uh, is beach fishing. Uh, you know, that's something that Marcos had said in Brazil. I mean, that's big down there in South America. They're using these exact same shrimp on big jig heads. It's the one place for most beaches. You don't have a ton of structure. You're going to get caught up in like in, a, in an inlet or a, or a pass and, uh, you know, launching these things out there and popping it or dragging it along the bottom, letting it go along in the, in the waves. And I mean, those guys catch those monster Rabalo. I mean, that's how you look. We were down in Costa Rica, remember? And uh, I mean, some of the biggest nook you've ever seen in your life. Uh, are down there and a lot of these guys are just using little fake plastic shrimp on a big old jig head and just making sure that sucker is, is hitting the bottom uh and it's almost like you can't overdo it i mean i, I know at some point you can you don't want a 10 ounce uh, uh, jig head on there but uh you can go pretty heavy and uh and it's amazing how effective a, a shrimp lure like that is on the beach uh have you guys was- tried it here in florida or anywhere in carolina georgia yeah, I, did. I, I was thrown even on the Gulf Coast. It was, it was, we had an onshore wind. So, that, I mean, it wasn't like surfable waves or anything, but it was decent sized waves just getting churned up. And so I had the half ounce jig head with the, with the bigger power prawn and was just thumping on the bottom and, and it caught some really nice snook. So they, they definitely, even though there was a lot of bait fish in the area, the, the power prawn got the job done. I think it just because it was right in their face. There was just the water was churned up and it's just a matter of kind of right spot, right, right time. Again, in most cases, they'll, if it's a good looking lure with a good action, they'll take a swipe of it, even if it's a shrimp and they've been eating mostly bait fish or vice versa. Um, good lure in front of their face usually wins. Especially got a little Dr. Juice on there. <laughs> Woo. Oh, Woo. Well, I, I would, I would, I've not tried to throw a prawn in front of a snook on the beach. We're going to get some calm weather days here soon. And that's, I've actually never tried to throw a snook presentation or a shrimp presentation to snook that I can see I, on the beach. I'd like to try that. I've been like oh, a spoon yeah. or a paddle tail guy, but I think that might be a, uh, might be the ticket. Cause I got to play cat and mouse with those fish all the time. And like hop, 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 hop. And like get them to chase it and react. But now that I can slow down and stay in that strike zone more, I think that's going to be, that's going to be, a, that's going to be a good lure. I got to try it yeah. out. Cool. Anything else guys before we wrap this up? I'm going to say the, like if, if shrimp lures in particular, if you're looking at a bunch of options, you'll notice that ours don't have all the little legs and stuff sticking out. Like a lot of the, the newer ones there, they look incredibly realistic, right? Like it's almost to the point where if you put the lure next to the real shrimp, they have the antenna sticking out, they have all of the different legs and the count of the legs spot on. And I've tried them. And I, I have really been disappointed with how they do. And there's two reasons for that. Number one is that a lot of it is the action in the water. And, and in most cases, like a little shrimp, when they get scared, it's not like a slow move. Like it's a dart. It's a quick dart. And when you have all those legs down there, it slows down the action of the water, of the lure. And so for that reason, that's why we took the legs out. And, and number two, the similar, similar deal is when you have all those antennas sticking out of there, your casting distance plummets, absolutely plummets. And, and for like, for Justin's area, a mile or two where you're sight fishing in shallow water, the longer you can cast, the more of a chance, like it's a really a total game changer as far as catching fish. And, uh, and so just, just not having all that fluff, it's a big, it's a big difference. Obviously they don't care about the fluff right there they're hitting a lure and there's a big hook sticking out of the top of it. And so they're not like, they don't have a magnifying glass. They're, they're looking if, if it ha- does it have good action. And as soon as they decide, yes, they're pouncing because the longer they wait, the, the lure, the, the, the bait, the live bait that they think it is, is gone. So they're they don't have a, their meal. Yeah. They don't have a long, lot of time to like sit there and analyze it. This is really like, if they see a good looking motion from a de- decent ways off, they're going to go and hammer it. Like that balcony snook, right? The cast was, was definitely not uh, not perfect, but that snook probably went like three feet, and, and you can see it came up and just slammed that lure uh, because it just I did like one little dart, and it decided that that little split tail jerk shad was either a shrimp or a bait fish or something, and it just came up and smacked it. it didn't like come up close and look at it; it it it, it pounced on it. So oh, is that you that is case. that you that caught the snook from the balcony? Yeah, I, I recognize you. Hair. Oh yeah, short <laughs> hair at that time. <laughs> Somehow I caught it without the long hair. I mean, that was like the one catch that, uh, that I haven't been able to, to trump um, with the longer hair, but, you know. <laughs> uh, too funny. But, yeah, I mean, take it from the Brazilians and, and you know, all these 
really really competitive anglers down in, in south america that's all they they use shrimp like that they don't even use paddle tails that much like they are all into shrimp and they've perfected it and they realize you don't have to have every little antenna and in fact it actually can hurt you so this is what they use i mean it's super super simple and, and most of them aren't even segmented you know ours just got the segment and we're looking at another mold that does not have the segmentation to last a little bit longer less likely to get you know, bitten off or, or torn. And uh, in that very first day that we used them, we used the the mold without the segmentation on it. It was just one, I mean, kind of like the DOA or, or Berkeley shrimp, the gulp shrimp and that probably has, has caught more, uh, more fish. Those two shrimp combined than anything. And they don't look like, they don't look real at all. They're like just kind of little TRDs, little turds in the water. Yeah, I but think they, the segmentation attracts humans more than the fish. Yeah. Uh, because looking at the, obviously, we've, you know, I've been doing a lot of tests on all this stuff because we just wanted to make sure, like, when we get something to put our name on it, we want it to be good. And it's looking at underwater footage on segmented versus non-segmented. I mean, the there's no difference because when you when you jerk it, right, even though the segmented tail moves every which way, like, it's just a straight dart. Like, when you when you hit it, it's going to do, like, a little kick, but it does it does pretty much the same thing. It's not quite as fluid on the non-segmented, but it has a little bit longer, um, a, a longer uh, little twitch without the segmentation just because there's less water drag. So both of them work though. Yeah. Maybe they're come up with the shrimp that looks so real. You can actually take the tail off and deter it like you would a real pill and eat shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> it is crazy how realistic some of these things are. And they win some of these awards and we're like, oh my gosh, has anyone ever caught a fish on that? No, why would we catch fish? It looks so good. Yeah, I have one over I here, know. but I got a live target one that it is like, it looks like a shrimp. It is, it is insane. Uh, I still haven't caught anything with it. <laughs> so, yeah. But it looks so good. You can't help but buy it. I think it looks so good. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a selling to a human uh, out of the water. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Well, cool guys. Hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully this answered some questions because we've seen this come up a few times. You can get all of the lures we've talked about over at fishstrong.com, fishstrong.com. And of course, insider members get 20% off everything in the store. Got some really cool things coming down. The pike is going to be good. And of course, if you haven't joined us yet in the club, join us. We've made it a complete no brainer. Go to saltstrong.com. You'll see up at the top, a place to come join the club. The only club that guarantees you will be catching more injured saltwater fish in less time. That means more fish per cast, impressing your friends, wowing your loved ones. And heck, everyone's going to be looking up to you and saying, wow, how did he or she get so stinking good at catching fish? It's a good feeling because we're in it. We've all been there. We've all had, you know, just some horrible years, not just days, but years of struggle and frustration. That's why we created the club in the first place is, to, to give you everything that we wish was there, no matter where you are, right? Luke, Luke you mentioned newbies don't stay newbies for long. And, and same with weekend warriors. We want you more consistent. We've had so many people now have gone to get their captain's license that are now making a living from this and putting other friends and, and family and complete strangers on fish. With that, th I think it's so cool. And now we've attracted many full-time fishing guys who just constantly want to get better and learn. And of course, save money and all your tackle. Uh, so if that sounds like you definitely come join us at saltstrong.com. You see just a, a handful of our fishing coaches. Got a couple more going to be adding on here in the next few months. So stay tuned for some big news there. Otherwise go over to saltstrong.com. And if you want to leave a comment, that's also the best place in the fishing tip section, you will see this blog post. And at the very bottom, you can leave a question. It'll come to us and we will be glad to answer it because I'm sure we probably left some stuff off. So we covered a lot in a short amount of time. Anything else, guys? Nope. Crickets. Any funny jokes? Nothing. Shrimp jokes. <laughs> yeah, we should. Uh, we need to have a joke thing at the end of it. I think you're right. Let's, let's make that a policy. But end on a. With that. End on a chuckle. All right, Justin, that's your job. What jingle? Well, yeah, you need the jingle, but that, no, the jingle is a, a clunch. Oh yeah, ready, yeah, yeah. I'm ready to jingle. If we're ready to jingle, let's let's bring it, dude. I'm I've been waiting for this. Okay, <clears throat> simplicity specialist. Listen, <laughs> specialist. Yes, that's it. it. And for those of you wondering what he's talking about, I'm talking about simplicity in your tackle selection and then becoming a specialist. 
right? Becoming really great at throwing a handful of lures, not 50, not like behind me. These are all lures that I've bought over the years and never even make it in the water anymore because you just don't need them. Become an expert, become a specialist. And, and that's another reason we keep talking about Slam Shady and Power Prawn and Alabama Leprechaun. It's because they just keep working and we've become specialists at them. And everyone on our, on our entire team, this is what we personally use. And we're all catching more fish because of it. Uh, and I feel like every time that I get in a slump, it's because I'm trying way too many things. And, uh, and you just like, oh, let's just go back to what works. So that is one more reason we talk about this stuff. It just flat out works. And there's something special to be said about being a specialist and keeping it simple. So thank you, Justin. Next time we will have a whole boatload full of, uh, of jokes, uh, all family-friendly jokes. So don't worry. Uh, guys, we'll see you on the next episode. Great job. Peace. We out. Whoop, whoop.